Hello, bom dia and ia akshamlaj. My name is Camille Kritzman. I'm a social media in internet witness. Um, today on Witness Live, we're discussing social media and activism. I have with me here today five activists from Turkey and Brazil joining us. So um, why don't we start by introducing ourselves a little bit. Um, Emre, why don't we start with you? Yeah, my name is I'm a journalist. I uh, uh, normally I'm a film news editor. This was an extraordinary event in weeks. I also covered in English to this in Daisy Park in Park. Uh, thank you. Um, Emra, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, my name is Emra. I'm also a journalist from Turkey. And basically for the last one month I've been covering social media and the protests in Turkey. Okay. Silvio? Uh, hello, my name is Silvio Maya. I am a vlogger and an English teacher and a writer and I'm responsible for the video Change Brazil, which talks about what's happening down here. Ana Maria? Hi there. My name is Ana Maria. I'm from Brazil, São Paulo. I'm part of a few groups of hacker activism, like Baixo Centro, SP na Rua, IBR na Rua. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'd like to start off this discussion with um, Emre. Um, so you wrote an article in the Huffington Post that we'll link in the description of this video, um, titled Be Behind Turkey's Vow Revolution. So what strategies have worked to make the revolution in, in Turkey viral? Yeah, it was, as I uh, said in the article, actually, the... Uh, Everybody, your mic isn't really working. <laughs> Sorry, we're having trouble hearing your mic, Emre. Can you hear me now? There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay. That's a little bit better. Yep, that's a little bit better. <laughs> okay, then I'm looking closer a little bit like this. Uh, so, as I said in the uh, Huffington Post article too, the protest movement is not a political revolution, definitely not a political revolution. Uh, but a communication revolution, I can say, uh, because it's the first time that in the world, maybe, that uh, social media was used so effectively by the protesters. If you look uh, at the statistics from the Arab world, if you look in uh, Libya, the Arab Spring, uh, social media didn't do that much. It was exaggerated a little bit, especially in the uh, in Libya. Uh, organizing uh, through social media, uh, there's 80% uh, uh, of the tweets uh, that was from, from uh, other countries, not from me. Which example was not like that, it was vice versa. So, uh, the good, uh, I mean, the most important part about the social media. We're having some trouble hearing you, I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> We'll come back to you. Maybe you might want to try to log off and then log back in. I will. Okay. Still, um, okay. So, um, sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, the next question I have more on the subject of viral images and media. Um, so, this question is to Silvio. So you've published a few videos on YouTube, a few that went viral with over a million views. Um, mm -hmm. These contained messages to an international audience as well as protesters, people involved in the protests. Um, and so I'm just wondering, um, why have you chosen YouTube as your primary mechanism for communication? Well, the outreach potential, really. It's, I, I think it's the, the video hosting site, which is overwhelmingly more popular than the rest. So. When we set out to do the Please Help Us video, we never thought that we would get as much recognition and it would be seen as much as it was, but we wanted to just shoot for as high a possibility as possible. Honestly, I'm not even aware of another video hosting site that is as successful as YouTube, you know? And throughout the other videos, I guess I motivated them to do the same. 
I guess YouTube and Facebook and Twitter are the most um, the most the, the greatest benefactors really to all these social revolutions, and I'm I'm pretty happy I chose that one really. Um, so in your video called Para Os Manifestantes, you mentioned, nice. the, <laughs> you mentioned the importance of using um, videos in capturing a protest. So um, can you just summarize for us, why is it so important to bring a video camera to a protest? Um, the effect of that is twofold, I guess, as well as the videos that I have posted. It, it really works on two fronts. Firstly, it informs the, uh, the Brazilian people and also the world population of what's going on down here, given, of course, Brazil's massive size. You know, the internet now makes it so that everyone can see what's happening locally, and we really want to take as much advantage of that so that the media doesn't manipulate us anymore, which is what corporate media tends to do everywhere. Um, they have their own agendas. And the other reason is because it helps to ignite fervor. You know, when you see these people with these cameras doing a really great job at filming what's going on, and some people compose, I guess, music video compilations of what's going on, and people talking. It helps people remain motivated for the fight, and they don't quit. You know, and I guess it's really what we want. the 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 greatest The greatest participants in any social movement isn't really people like ourselves. Uh, we could just kind of help ignite the fire, but the greatest participants is the hundreds of thousands of people that are on the street protesting. They're the ones that incite fear into the governance that is doing the wrong things. And we want to keep them awakened. And these videos, as they flood social media, keep reminding people of what's important, especially in a generation that is so fond of being distracted by things. Yeah. So those are the two reasons, yeah. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the topic of recording a protest, um, this is a question I'm opening up to anyone who wants to answer. So are there any instances where you've seen the police change their behavior um, due to the presence of a video camera or because they knew that they were being... Um, Recorded. Change Brazil. I mean, I'm sorry, Sylvia. I'll ask you first. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Brazil, um, the nature of police themselves is is, is kind of uh, a delicate one, and I guess my fellow Brazilian uh, participants can attest to that. When it comes to police behavior, in in front or not in front of cameras, there is a greater motivator behind their their activities and their actions. A lot of these guys are doing things they don't want to do. A lot of the guys that are arresting and taking in the protesters or sending gas bombs and whatnot, they are under the threat of being fired. And some of them have actually decided to not carry out their orders and have been fired because of that. Some of them have been detained. We have stories of people that have been uh, taken to jail, arrested, uh, without a quick and speedy trial. They're just in jail now and apparently indefinitely. So these guys have something bigger to worry about than the backlash of um, the internet seeing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. the, the police here isn't really so much up to date with the power of the internet. Uh, I guess they're older and a little bit more outdated. They don't really know how strong it is. They do change their behavior when they feel the fervor, but not because of the points. Well, in my experience, anyway. Awesome. Um, Emra, have you noticed any, um, do you have any comment on this? Yeah, I mean, like Silvio said, in Turkey also, uh, one, most of the police are uh, quite young. They are not social media and technology savvy. So mostly they don't realize that they are being filmed by uh, smartphones. Mm -hmm. And so what, uh, what we see circulating in social media is police violence. And, you know, uh, you also see uh, the footage, like, where the police is behaving, behaving nicely while there's mainstream media. And you see a uh, mainstream media camera cut off, and then the police violence start all over again. But like Silvio said, uh, they, are, they, are, they are not very in sync with the technologies and social media, so they are not really aware of they are being filmed during the, uh, during the riots. That's what I've noticed in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Maria, I know you've been to most protests. Um, do you have anything to comment on this? I think it's not just the police that's a little behind um, about uh, all this technology. I think it's all the politicians actually. They are not ready to deal with this. How people can make their own TV or their own yeah. news. Yeah. So I think if you if you you can find quite easily on YouTube, there is this video this video about a police officer breaking uh, the police car, yeah. the window. It's just like, yeah, that was the man, the guys on the manifestation, and actually. 
that's a lie. So basically, I think they should be worried about us uh, because we have uh, smartphones and we are ready to shoot a film about them. So. Yeah, if I may jump in on that, something really interesting happened here in Brazil. Um, this hike in the popularity of uh, internet-driven outreach is making the corporate media just look pathetic. Because one of the greatest, oh, that one of the greatest uh, TV stations here in Brazil that actually almost had a monopoly over the TV market as a whole, it's called Globo, and they have a stake in promoting the World Cup because they have the advert, the, the the broadcasting rights. So. Well, while the protests are taking place, they're just coming up with a bunch of outrageous lies about how they're happening. Mm -hmm. They're portraying the, the protesters as criminals and they're just horrible people. Whereas at the same time, we have a flood of videos that show exactly the opposite. People are just walking peacefully and being attacked by police. So, so all of the people in power, just when the media and the police and whoever else, is just so woefully unaware of the power that we have with uh, the internet, they're just making them look pathetic. The more they try to keep using the old game of of uh, editing information to pursue their own agenda, the more visibility they tend to lose and the the sadder they look, which is something really cool. Yeah, yeah this is um, this is actually I think we're just um, joined by a new participant, um, Raphael. Are you there? Turn <laughs> off a little, I guess. <laughs> well, this, this is a topic that I'm sure that you could speak to, but in the meantime, um, I'm going to direct my next question at Emra, having yeah. to do with um, having to do with kind of government uh, mainstream media campaigns going awry. Um, so, Emra, we all heard about the infamous hashtag war between the mayor of Ankara and activists. So, as a resident of Ankara, journalist and social media expert, um, do you think social media is becoming kind of a battleground with citizen journalists? versus the government? Well, it's definitely being a, a, becoming a ba battleground, but it's not a fair battleground. First of all, the government, uh, among the top ten uh, most influential uh, social media figures, five of them are politicians in Turkey. But they don't know, they are totally out of sync with the new generation, with new media, uh, with the new age actually. So mm -hmm. uh, they have Facebook accounts, they have Facebook pages, but they don't know how to use it. They are just using like, like a, a condensed 140 character press release. There is no dialogue, no conversation. And with Mayor Gökçek, for example, when he began his fight with hashtags, uh, it was it eventually turned into a comedy. He would wake up in the morning, he would write into his Twitter account, okay, I'm going, uh, I'm going to announce today's hashtag. And one of those hashtags was uh, directed at CNN International. And he urged all of his followers, thousands of tens of thousands of followers, to uh, gather in front of New York City's uh, CNN International building and only six people showed up. Ah. I mean, that, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it shows how out of, in, out of sync they are with the new media. They have Twitter accounts, but they don't know how to use it. They don't know the dynamics of social media and the nature of its, you know, the uh, interactive nature, the nature of its being a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and as on the topic of Twitter campaigns gone haywire, um, Emre, I actually wanted to ask you, based from reading your article, um, can you describe any instances where, I guess, as Emre was describing, the government's social media strategy ended up being a huge disadvantage for them or got commandeered, taken over by activists? Hmm? I think he's having trouble with his mic. Okay, I think Emre's having trouble with, I think Emre is having trouble with his mic. Um, which is unfortunate, but um, we'll continue. So, um, so we're, we were joined recently by um, Raphael. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, I'm Raphael. I'm from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a video maker, and I make mostly comedy videos about uh, political issues. So, yes, I've been taking part in the recent protests that there were in Brazil. And I've been following a lot of what's going on on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> I just Great. joined the chat. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's much appreciated. So um, before you joined in, Silvio was actually mentioning how mainstream media can sometimes misrepresent very dramatically um, the protesters and the movement. So, Raphael, in your most recent viral video invo um, involves mocking the mainstream press for its description of the protesters. Yes. So, um, my question to you is, how does social media tackle misinformation in mainstream media? 
so uh, the mainstream media in Brazil, like TV and newspapers and magazines, they're all ruled by economical and mostly political interests. So they were putting on the news the recent protests, uh, saying that there were vandals, people were vandalizing public buildings, yeah. there was photos of, of things on fire, and there was no word about police violence, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of police violence. And this yeah. police violence happens a lot on favelas, like on slums, and on poor parts of Brazil. But since a lot of people were filming, uh, most of these scenes of police violence got to YouTube and Facebook, so the protest started as a protest against the bus fare that raised 20 cents. But right. each time there was a new protest, there was more people there, because people would see on the internet what was really going on there. And people were, were talking to each other, so you had 5,000 on the first protest in Rio, then 10,000, and then it raised to 100,000, and over 300,000, like in yeah. two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think it's mostly because of the social media, because people could see the other side. And then even the mainstream media, since it's been very, very spread in the social media, even the mainstream media had to change their speech. And they started yeah. saying, oh, it's not about vandals. This is a peaceful demonstration. And just a minority of people are making violence acts. So even yeah. they had to change the speech, and that's mostly because people filmed it. And if it was for the mainstream media, really, this wouldn't be on the news. They are if even could... using uh, images from internet, from yeah. uh, mobiles, shooting, something like, oh, we don't have an image from that. We need to yeah. take from the internet because we, we weren't there. We don't know what's yeah. happening. So we need to, oh, OK, let's go to Facebook and find some uh, images to use on our exactly. uh, evening news. And mm -hmm. the, what, what scared me the most, since this became too big that people were filming by themselves, is that uh, the police started taking cameras from protesters. So yeah. there's even a video where they film that the police officers are taking cameras from people and saying, you cannot film here, and this shows that I mean, even the police and the state, they're aware of this and they're afraid of this because they know there's, uh, it's against their interests. Yeah, this, yeah, this actually goes with an earlier question I was asking about, um, about how the police change their behavior because there's a camera nearby. So I guess now they're becoming um, more and more aware of, I guess, what social media is out there and what it can really do to expose their actions. Is it the same in Turkey? Is, um, is this, have you noticed the same thing in Turkey, Emra? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is even. Uh, it might even be worse in Turkey. We knew that mainstream media, the TV channels, were in, in uh, controlled by the government, and uh, we, we would call them pro media. But when the riots began, uh, they had no coverage for the first five days. They had no coverage of the events. In fact, one of the channels, CNN, CNN Turk, uh, while, uh, there was police riot all over Turkey in 79 cities. CNN Turk broadcasted a documentary on penguins. Right. So the penguins <laughs> became a symbol of Turkish <laughs> resistance. So this was so, actually I mean, a question. Yes, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> even now, uh, I mean, there, there, there's so much footage, but when they're covering, you know, like, like you, you guys said in Brazil, it's the same. Like there's a few group of marginal people, looters, uh, uh, just resisting against the government, just uh, a bunch of them. So. I mean, mainstream media is not reflecting anything true in Turkey as well. I think that what, what, what happens uh, in these cases, it really shows the true face of a corporate-owned organization, whichever it is, media or anything else. Um, they pretend to be benevolent at times of peace when they have nothing to lose. But when something happens that uh, the broadcasting of which might put their interest in jeopardy, they change their game. Uh, here in Brazil, they actually went so far as to ask two of the most renowned soccer idols uh, who were immortalized by the people that love them to talk about people quitting the protests and watching the games. The guys actually went on television and said, come on guys, stop protesting, watch the games, soccer team is our soul. It's time for football, yeah. <laughs> yeah, remember that? It, and, it, and it backfired horribly. I, yeah, I never I imagined. The government's use of social media really, I guess, I guess in these cases, um, completely backfired. I actually want to bring it back really quickly to a point that Emra said about um, the penguins. So um, I noticed in monitoring these protests, um, 
I guess kind of as like a, in a in a way that this backfired. Um, a, a, the penguin became kind of a symbol in Turkey of the protests. I I think it's in in part mostly because of the the footage they decided to show while the country was in an upheaval of this penguin documentary. So I was actually going to ask this to Emre because he talked about this a lot in his article. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, what symbols and how has the use of symbolism been effective in social media in really transmitting the idea of the protests? Oh, you got to say the guy Fox mask, right? Yes. You have been yeah, dead, man, that. that. Um, Anna Maria, I know you're you're involved with a lot of art, so do you have anything to comment on that? I think there are a few symbols here in Brazil that we are using a lot, like the vinegar, because on the most um, violent manifestation here in Sao Paulo, they start to uh, jail people because you have vinegar in your bag and people are, what? I'm carrying vinegar so I should go to jail? And that I think that was the most powerful symbol until now. We have the gas mask and everything else, but the vinegar was V for vinegar. As, vinegar. Yeah, like in the film. Vinegar. Uh -huh. so we use a lot, actually. People are doing t-shirts, and uh, if you have a vinegar at home, people make jokes like, oh, you are a vandal, huh? You have a vinegar. <laughs> so I, I really think that's the most powerful one here. Uh, and, well, they... I don't know. I think police right now receive some orders to be a little bit quieter. And like today, today, huge things are happening here in Sao Paulo. There is this general strike and people are doing actually a big manifestation in front of oh, uh, this amazing. huge channel TV, Global. So the city is quite uh, silent right now. And I'm worried, but anyway. Is and... It? I think the vinegar will be up, will be will come to the my t uh, will appear on my timeline again, mm -hmm. and the masks as well. I do have a very nice mask for today. I will use uh, later, and I have a glass, some Google glasses, like to protect my eyes. And I think people are using a lot of this uh, guy folks uh, mask for that, but I don't think that people really get the meaning of that. So they, I don't think that even the had read uh, V for um, what's Vendetta. the name in English? V for Vendetta. Yes, this one, this one. So uh, I think these are these are the most popular symbols from now. I, but yeah, I want to jump in real quick and just just add one more. The hashtag. I, I mean, the the hashtag I think is the one thing that made this whole thing possible. Uh, when, whenever Twitter had this idea, I think they were thinking about selling Nike shoes and you say I like my Nikes. Hashtag Nike. I think they never imagined that it will have the repercussion it did. If you're wondering for the hashtag things, uh, here in Brazil we had three um, change Brazil, which I was responsible for. Also, Vem Pra Rua, which this activist slash singer composed a song on, it became viral as well. Come, come pra, Vem Pra Rua, if you know Portuguese means come to the streets. And this other one called O Gigante Acordou, The Giant Awaken, which is a reference to a whiskey commercial, uh, oddly enough. I like commercials here. Yeah, yeah but... These hashtags, they become a, a, a convenient way for people to know what's going on. When you, whenever you have something to say, you write it down and put the hashtag in, and people will immediately know what's going on as soon as they hit the same hashtag. I think that is the universal symbol for revolution, the pound sign, if I could say, yeah. more than anything else. What I realized also by this, uh, the search with hashtags, uh, sometimes I was in the protest, and I had some friends who were online and reading what's going on on Twitter, so if you're standing at one point, you know exactly what's going on. Like, oh, on this uh, subway station, the police officers are taking people out, and you you know kind of know a lot of a lot more and in real time and from everywhere. Even when I stayed home, there was one protest. I stayed home, and then you could talk to people. I could call my friends and don't go to this place or go to this place. People are reuniting there, and it's kind of like it's just networking, making networks. Everybody's connecting. Through through social media, yeah. Um, yeah. That's very interesting how it's become kind of a, I guess, method of organization in protests. Um, yeah. Just to change gears a little bit, um, I have a question for both Anna Maria and Emra. So Emra wrote an article called "It's Not Being Easy Being a Woman at a Protest." So in this article, um, you mentioned a few double standards that women endure during protests. So um, do you think that social media in any way 
aggravates these double standards, or do you see it reflected at all in social media, Emra? Well, uh, I mean, there's always uh, double standards when it comes to women, and uh, during the so during the protests in Turkey, there were the double standards in uh, certain respects. But women and men uh, were equal on streets, and both in, both in social media and both on streets. And in fact, that the government, uh, the ruling government in Turkey, has been quite oppressive uh, on women. Uh, asking uh, our prime minister has been asking women to have three children. Uh, there, there have been attempts to. Uh, pass res uh, restrictions on abortion. You know, uh, the go the government is trying to create these obedient, pious housewives in Turkey. So uh, the government has been more uh, <clears throat> oppressive on women, and so women are, have been on the on forefront uh, in protests, They're both on the street and in social media. In fact, when you look at the websites, you know, websites of timelines and compiling information, compiling graffiti, legal rights, most of them uh, have been created by women in Turkey. Um, Ana Maria, have you seen any si similar such sim situations in Brazil? I think here the problem was the police because even though my grandmother called me and, oh, you are a good girl, stay at home, and I was like, uh-huh, no, grandma, sorry about that. Um, I think the problem here was the police, they were more cruel with women on the street. There is uh, a very interesting video on São Bernardo do Campo, there is a small city pretty close to Sao Paulo and there is like there are like five police officers hitting a girl that was already on the floor and they were hitting like with the, the sticks the, the rubber sticks like well according to the girl they were shouting something like oh you wanna be a girl on the street you will be on the street and they, they uh, everyone in social media from since the beginning were advising girls be aware about the officers, they are trying to hit you harder for you learn a lesson. I don't know if what that's supposed to mean, but I don't care really. And I think again, the videos, the photos, the everything that you can find on the internet proves that they want to hit you really hard. So wow, uh, yeah. One, one thing I've noticed on the protests in Rio. And especially like before the big protest, there was some protest against the the amount of money that was put on stadiums. And one thing that was noticed by a lot of people is that the police would always start the violence towards women. Because then all the men that are around, they go for it and they go to protect the women. And then you can justify, we have to shoot rubber bullets. And I've heard a few cases of friends of mine who are women and they said the aggression started towards them. And it's like police officers were men, they, they started uh, hitting women. So that it justifies that the men come in defense. That's incredible. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in Turkey, have there been any examples that um, are similar to this at all? I mean, I, 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 I'm really surprised to hear uh, what's been going on, uh, what, what Rafael said. Uh, in Turkey, um, th th there is violence towards both women and men. There are images like uh, you mentioned, Anna Maria, of uh, women being beaten up by three poli uh, four policemen. But you also see uh, five policemen beating a man. So <laughs> there are double standards in police brutality in Turkey. In terms of women and they beat everyone. They beat everyone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, no <laughs> I've noticed in both um, Brazil and Turkey and in other um, and many other international pro well, protests that have happened, there's always there always seems to be like an iconic image of a woman being sprayed with tear gas. Um, Emma, can you explain at all why this is so um, pervasive and dynamic in social media? The the image, I mean. Uh... The image of that, you know, you, you all must have seen that, the one with the, you know, red summer dress with white bag slung over her shoulder. It was the first day of the protest, be before the protest began actually, when people gathered for a sit-in in, uh, uh, in Gezi Park. Just, you know, a sit-in to protect uh, the area uh, from being demolished. And the police came unexpectedly and started tear gassing. So it was the beginning of everything, that's why it's such an iconic image. I mean, mm. there, there are many reasons for it to become an iconic image, but one of the major reasons is one of the first paper uh, paper sprays we have seen uh, about five weeks ago. And there's another image we have of the uh, woman in blue dress defying against 
the big uh, police riot cars yeah. and you know water water cannons splash all over her dress that's another iconic image in turkey i i guess uh the, the, these things kind of have a a a, a double repercussion um whenever every time a uh, protester stands up to the police and gets bashed out for it. What happens is when that's documented, it just becomes more motivation for others to do the same. Um, the police doesn't realize that every time that they try to suppress with violence, what they do is they give protesters a reason to go back and fight against the protest of violence in itself. What I saw a picture of was a guy in a protest holding up a sign which said, I am here fighting for my right to be here, which I thought was just so deep, you know. Uh, there's an underlying cause over all of this, and I guess there's an underlying mission. What we cannot do is let violence win. Besides the whole point of what we're trying to prove, what we're trying to change, we really can't make it so that by that the police sets a precedent. And every time they try to do something violent, they become successful and quit. We can't let them learn that lesson. You know, if that's the case, then tyranny might uh, prevail. I think there are two things on this subject. First of all, all uh, all the world right now is an inspiration. So Turkey from Brazil right now it's really some a direct connection for us. There is this saying on the street that the the sentence is there is no more love. This will turn to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And people are shouting this very bravely, like oh my God, here we became so as in the same level or in the same situation as Istanbul or any city in Turkey and this is quite impressive yeah. and I think we should understand that all these images are for us that don't believe well that believe in a different ways to do things are impressive there is this Facebook um, page fan and a lovers police I think is the name I loved police in Brazil something like this is eu amo a rota Mm -hmm. And it's really impressive what they can, how can they change the subject. So they take this picture, they took this picture from this red dress girl in, in Istanbul, and they change some, and they put in a uh, subtitle like, oh, if this girl was at home, that never would happen. And I was like, what? Uh. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's serious. So. Um. Social yeah, media like, can be both ways, right? So yeah, it can I mean, be. Totally, totally. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to cut you guys off because we're slightly running low on time. I just want to mm -hmm. ask one last question that I'm going to ask all of you guys to answer. Um, so, is there one tip that um, is there one social media tip that you'd like to give to other activists who want to get involved and do what you're doing in social media? Um, we can start with you, Raphael. <laughs> uh, I would say. Uh, both share everything <clears throat> and make good networking but also be careful because uh, there's not only protesters watching your page especially in Brazil it's known that uh, police and the government are watching profiles public profiles oh, yeah. and even like, all social network so be careful with what you share because you're now on watch and just be careful and share as, as much as you can thank you <laughs> Emra? Yeah, I, I agree with Rafael definitely. And in, another thing I would add to uh, what Rafael said is that verify your sources. You know, uh, yeah. everything is fine when you are sharing graffiti and nice pictures and videos, but when there is police right and you are sharing information about, you know, what street to run and the numbers of legal advice and doctors, I mean, you definitely need to verify your sources. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just can I can I make a small compliment to what he said? Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. Also, yeah. This checking sources is very important because there's a lot of videos coming up of police violence that are not from these protests, and they're very important. But if you if you share false information, you really weaken the debate. So really check your sources yeah. all the time and yeah. make this. You have to do this always, always. Yeah. So the yeah. other. Um, I have a few things, and I guess I'll be quick uh, while talking so I can put them on in without losing too much time. Uh, firstly, whenever there's a protest going on in the street, keep your Wi-Fi un unrestricted. Uh, take the take the, the password off so that with every, whenever somebody needs to have a quick internet access, they can use yours. That's very important to, to keep things going quickly. Second, definitely verify your sources, not so much, well, not only in police brutality, which is also important, but also in the decisions that the government makes regarding the protests. 
whatever they decide to do, what they're going to do and when and who it regards. Make sure that you know exactly if that what you're saying is completely accurate because if you don't, there are people from the government itself that are, that are paid by the opposition in order to delegitimize you. They will come and comment neg negatively on the things you have to say in order to make you look bad in front of everyone. That's kind of what I personally have suffered. And it really, like he said, weakens the debate, weakens the resolve, and it drives confusion, and it makes people break apart, which is something we don't want. So yeah, keep your Wi-Fi open, uh, verify your sources, and make maximum use of every hashtag there is. Every time you comment something, every time you have something to say, hashtag it all. That way it's quick for people to come across your information as soon as they want it. You know? So I guess these two things. Hashtag, internet, open, and verification. Um, Ana Maria? Well, they said the most more, the, the, f the best advice they have said already. But I would say something like, learn more, uh, more about other social medias. There are plenty more things than Twitter and yeah. Facebook. There is Mumble, there is uh, Bamboozer, there is Scoopit. Things that you should learn, including how it works for yourself. How, how it's the best way to share uh, your information. I think so. Yeah. We have time for one more question. We have a question from people watching. Um, so we have time for one more question, actually. And we have a question from um, actually people watching this live. Um, do they identify more as activists or journalists? So um, I guess this is the question I'll once again open up to all of you. Do you identify more as activists or journalists? Raphael? Uh, I see myself as an artist, and I guess art has everything to do with politics. So I heard a term this week, it's called artivist. So maybe I'm an artivist, but uh, I think activism should be on everybody's life, on day to day life nowadays. So I consider myself more as an artist. I mean, for me, the definitions are very blurred now, journalist and activist and social yeah. media, whatever. I mean, when I'm standing it, when I'm tweeting that, be careful of the police on Kennedy Street, I'm actually, a, you know, a journalist there, as well as an activist there, but I'm at home drinking my beer at the same time. I mean, it's all blurred. So, I mean, I'm all at the same time and none at some. Uh, Compliments to what had just been said. In my personal opinion, every journalist should become an activist when the time calls for it. I mean, if you have any integrity at all, um, you got to report on the truth. And sometimes the truth is there are bad people doing bad things. So I guess every journalist, if he knows what's good for his um, own righteous nation, become an, an activist. Myself, I, I'm really just a blogger. I'm an English teacher. And I just happen to have the, the tools and the resources at my disposal in order to make an, uh, a message be reached. At the time, I guess duty called. And it was a very good idea to broadcast to the world what was happening here. No one had done so yet. And that's why I decided to do it. But as soon as it's done, I, I don't really want to stay in the political game. I think it would be really shameful for me to take advantage of what's going on for personal reasons. So as soon as these laws change and everything goes back to normal, I'll go back to being a vlogger and an English teacher and I guess an activist of the time calls for it, as I hope everyone in the nation can become. So that's that. Uh, could you please repeat the question? I had some connection problems here. Okay. Um, the question asked by um, someone who was watching this live was, do you consider yourself to be more of an activist or a journalist? Ooh, myself? An activist. <laughs> I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, well, I don't really work as a journalist or something close to. And second, I was an activist before all these manifestations. I, I, I'm pro. São Paulo, I think the city needs more love. I don't use, I don't really want to use this word, but anyway, it is what the city needs, and I, I think I am just an activist, maybe our Turkish fellow. Ah. <laughs> Only okay. one journalist here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those. Um, okay, so actually. Um, this, I think, is the last question we'll have time for. So this, I'm going to direct to Anna Maria, but um, I'm opening up to Raphael, too, because um, you consider yourself an artist as well. So um, do you think that social media is an art? And how can art and social media work together for activism? Anna Maria, I'll start with you. Mm, I think it can be art. I think it's not so... People really don't care. But when they start to care, 
mm, things get really good with yeah. this. So I think it's a tool, right? So we are using in a beautiful way. So right now, um, people are using this on a, not black blocks, but the white blocks, right? We should make something fun. We should make something beautiful, even for the officers, even for everyone. Yeah. So I think that's the moment then when social media became an art. It's the moment that communication can be beautiful and can really touch people because of, of this, uh, uh, on how the, we can work this, this communication. Yeah. I wouldn't say uh, social media is an art itself, but it's definitely a channel. And I think in the whole history, like art has a lot to do with politics and Definitely. with social changes. So I think social media comes as a very powerful channel so that new artists will go through this blocking of commercial interests. And like my videos, some of them are seen over 100,000 people. I would, I would never have this public if I depended on the mainstream media, on financial interests. So I think like social media is now essential. I have so many examples of friends who live as artists and this was just possible because of the social media because they could share their content and just like freely you, you reach directly your public. So I think social media is essential for art right now. I'm sorry for speaking so much. If I can jump in real quick just for an advice for all the artists that are watching this uh, as a compliment. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll be super fast. Don't apologize. Make great art. <laughs> Yeah, um, make great art. Uh, remember, the guys that are on the streets doing this are not doing it for a salary. They're not getting paid. They're not. They're, the only motivation for their actions, for our actions, is passion. And passion is ignited by emotional, uh, emotional touching. So if you make beautiful art, if you make beautiful music, it will rouse spirits up in order to act. That's been used by governments for centuries as propaganda. And I guess we can do it now. So continue making great videos. I saw a guy putting a video of this band, 30 Seconds to Mars, with this uh, protest in Maringa, change Brazil. I literally cried. It was amazing, you know. And he made me want to go out and just like, punch the president. I guess it's called, in a good way. <laughs> but it really wows up. It really wows up spirits. So don't quit making art. It will it will benefit your name, and most of all, it will benefit the movement by touching the hearts of people. You guys are one of the most prominent gears in this movement. You know? So if you're an artist, man, get to work. So, um, Emma, do you have any examples of like your favorite artistic demonstration you've seen in Turkey? I mean, it's it's amazing. It's become a renaissance of sorts in Turkey, and you know there was a, in cinema and in literature there was a soul in music, and I, we all believe that everything is going to change. You know, every day there are all these new videos, street art, graffiti websites, and now there is a, a comic book. A Occupy Turkey comic book series. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Everyone is inspired and everyone is feeling this new energy that, that, that can flow freely and creatively, unlike just two or three months ago. We, we were, you know, we were all dead a couple of months ago, and now everyone is so feeling so free and creative and inspirational. So, I mean, nice things are waiting us, I think, both Brazil and Turkey. Okay. Um, so that's actually all the time we have, but I would really like to thank Rafael, Emra, Silvio, and Anna Maria so much for attending and to those who are tuning in live thanks so much for watching um, in the description we're going to list all the articles in order that were mentioned um, and to those viewing live this will be also streamed on our witness YouTube channel so uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this and you can find all these guys on Twitter. and you can find all these people on Twitter we will be sure to add their information thank you so much Thank you. Ciao, thanks. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.